stands out and is astounding and that is man now unlike all the other creatures man can change his surroundings he can change his environment he can build buildings to keep the weather out he can build musical instruments he can sing gather together to discuss to listen all kinds of things that no other creature can do. Now there are some creatures which have got greater power than man. For example, a horse can run faster than a man can. But people can control them and go exactly as fast as a horse. And looking up, man sees the bird and without wings, how can he fly? Well, he makes himself some wings and flies. And not only can he copy the birds, he can think of ways of flying of which there is no equivalent in nature. And he can make aeroplanes which can fly further, faster, higher than any of the birds. And if that's not enough, he can make himself rockets which can go right out of the atmosphere and he can even land on the moon. And while he's doing this, the nearest thing that can approach to man can only sit and wonder. Look on in amazement, totally unable to do any of the things we've been looking at. Now there is a saying that clothes make a man. Well, it's actually not true because man makes clothes. And just because you dress an animal up in clothes does not make it one little bit more like a man. Now there are some things that you can dress up to look very human. Chimpanzees, for example. And there is an urge among many people today to minimize the difference between man and all the other creatures. I think it was Margaret Sanger who said, a boy is a dog is a pig. You know, the idea being really there isn't any difference between man and the other animals. Now, I think that even Margaret Sanger, if she were about to board this train and saw getting into the driver's carriage a chimpanzee dressed in a train driver's uniform, she'd get off that train. It would not be any consolation that the chimpanzee was dressed up to look like a train driver. A chimpanzee cannot drive train. And even though when we're in a situation like this, we often shout at another driver, particularly if it's a, a minibus taxi, and say that he's driving like a monkey. But if you actually put a monkey 
behind the controls of a car. You would have a disaster very quickly. Because only man can handle things like that. There is a saying that man is distinguished from other creatures only in that he uses tools. Well, man certainly does use tools. A vast array of different kinds of tools. Not only can man use tools, he can do two jobs at once. You can see this lady is not only answering telephones, she's also working on a computer. Two extremely complex jobs with two completely different kinds of tools. And those who would have us believe that the difference between men and animals is only that they can use tools, well, I wonder how many of us would be happy if a tool like this was handed to a chimpanzee when we were on the operating table. See, it's not just the tools. What makes the difference is that these people know what to do with those tools. And it takes a great deal of skill, intelligence, and practice to use them. What really is the huge difference between man and animals is the ability to think and communicate. A man is the only animal, the only creature, that can think and communicate. Now, thinking has been part of life since the beginning. Unfortunately, today, there's very little thinking goes on compared to what used to go on because nowadays people spend their time in front of a television set being amused. Amuse is a combination of two words. A, not, muse, think. So when one sits being amused, one is sitting not thinking. But even today, there are times when people close their eyes and think. And when they do that, there is a chance that they will come across the fundamental question of life. The question which has arisen in the minds of thinkers since time immemorial, right back to the beginning of civilization. And that question which must at some time come to anyone who thinks is why is there anything instead of nothing? It would be much more logical to expect nothing at all. But why is there something? And when you open your eyes, you don't only see an image of something that's not really there, you're surrounded by real objects. Objects of amazing beauty, like flowers, sunshine, trees. And this something goes on and on. You can walk up to the horizon over there, and there stretching out in front of you, there's another horizon. And you can walk for hours, for days, for weeks, if you've got the time. Without coming to the end of it, and long before you came to the end of it, you'd notice there are other things that you don't stand a chance of reaching by walking. Up there in the sky, there are other things. And if you go and get a telescope, you can see planets even bigger than the Earth. You can see stars, galaxies, which are thought to be islands of stars, every one of which would make the Earth look like a complete dwarf. And wherever you look, there are more of these galaxies, vast quantities. There's not only something instead of nothing. There's a huge amount of something instead of nothing. 
Why? Why is there something instead of nothing? And throughout the history of human thought, there have only ever been two answers put forward. Now, people today don't seem to like that. And there are plenty of people who say, there must be more than two possibilities. And you ask them, well, give them to me. And they say, well, well, there must be more than two possibilities. But the only two that have ever been thought of are either the creation was created by a creator, or the creation created itself. There are only two possibilities. And those are very different answers. And the answer to that question is amazingly important because depending on which of those answers you choose to believe, you will have a completely different idea of the meaning of existence. Because if you are convinced, or you choose, to believe that first one, then you are presented with a universe of purpose, accountability, and metaphysics. If the creation is created by a creator, he must have done it for something. He wouldn't do, make something for nothing. There must be a purpose behind it. And since part of that something that was created is me, I must have some purpose in it. And if I have a purpose, then <coughs> I'm accountable. I may be called to give an account of the way I lived this life I was given. Have I got an account that will satisfy the Creator? There is what Aristotle called metaphysics. What goes on behind the physics? We can look at all these things around us, the world, at the things, the physical objects of this creation. Things we can touch, see, smell, taste, the physical things around us. But if the universe was created by a creator, there must be something behind it, something we can't see, smell, touch, and taste. On the other hand, if the creation created itself, then we don't live in a universe of purpose, but one of chance. And there's no accountability. We just happen to be here, not because anyone created us, but just, well, that's the way it happened to come about. So we're on our own boss. Nobody can tell me what's right and wrong. I've got a mind of my own. I can decide my body, I can do with it what I want. It's my life, I can live it the way I want. <coughs> and there is materialism because the material world is all that there is. If you can't see, touch, smell, taste it, it's a myth, it doesn't exist. So one has a completely different view of reality. If you accept creation was created by a creator, or the creation created itself. Well, what have we got to make us to choose between the two? Human nature being what it is, by far the most attractive is surely this. Most people would like to be their own boss. I don't want to be told what to do with my life. It's my life, I can lead it the way I want. So, as far as I can see, the only reason for choosing this option rather than that is if the evidence leads one to think this is true, and that's not. Because for most people, I'm quite convinced this would be the more convenient alternative. 
And yet, when we look throughout history, throughout all the societies that have been recorded on, uh, in, in history, all of them have gone for this. They've all gone for the idea of a creator. Until very recently, this worldview was a tiny minority worldview. You look at all the civilizations of the past, they were all religious. They all believed in gods, goddesses, or one god. We might ask, why was this worldview so common, so prevalent, when in a way one would say it's, um, it's got less to offer to the, to the ego than the other one? The reason is usually called the argument from design. If you find a watch, you would never say this created itself. Because you have an experience of the material world. And you know that things like that do not create themselves. They need a creator. Well, when we look at the creatures, like, for example, man, we find all sorts of complex organs, each one far more complex than the watch. Every single cell in this body is millions of millions of times more complex than a watch. There's a brain here which has more computing power than the best supercomputers. So, throughout history, people have said, look, this can't have happened by chance. Something like this needed a designer. As David said in Psalm 139, I am fearfully, wonderfully made, and this my soul knows well. So, when one looks at the, shall we say, the great thinkers of our civilization, as Johannes Kepler, he said, the privilege of a scientist is to think God's thoughts after him. And Isaac Newton, who said, the great value of his work was showing the greatness of God. And we have James Clark Maxwell, the father of everything to do with electricity and magnetism, microwaves, just about all communication systems. He said he gained his insight into his scientific work by seeing the way God works in the Bible. Then there are many others, Michael Faraday, for example. They all opted for this. The creation was created by a creator because they were so convinced that the evidence of the creation shouted creator. The choice we make will have a huge influence on the way we live whether we will we know we are accountable or whether we know we are our own boss depends entirely on that choice and people who want to be their own boss have looked for ways to be their own boss one such person charles lyle we'll look at him in future lectures he was a lawyer and he turned his attention to geology. And he had a great design in his work in geology. And after he'd written a very famous textbook called Principles of Geology, he wrote to another man, who you may well recognize here, his friend Charles Darwin. And he said, I have destroyed the book of Genesis without mentioning the Bible. And Darwin, then building on his work, published another book, which was 
even more influential than principles of geology. Now, we tend to think of Darwin as the inventor of the theory of evolution. It's not true. The theory of evolution had been around for a long time. He learned evolution from his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who had a theory. But the problem with the theories which had been put forward was there was no mechanism. Everybody would look at the complexity of these creatures, at the impossibility of one turning into another, and say, well, I wish it was true, but they didn't have a convincing argument until Darwin latched upon an idea called natural selection. Now, it wasn't his idea. It was put forward by another biologist, and the other biologist put it forward saying this was the means by which the weak and unfit are weeded out. Darwin twisted the idea a bit and said, no, this is the mechanism by which the more fit come about. Now the story with natural selection is given some living creature, now how that comes about we conveniently get. Darwin said he thought it probably started in some warm little pond, he didn't know how, but well if it starts there, at every reproduction there are small changes. Some of the changes must be advantageous. And natural selection will make sure that those good changes get preserved. The bad ones die out. And this is the way things get better and more complex. Just random chance. Some of the changes are good, some are bad, but natural selection makes sure that they good ones reproduce, the bad ones die out. So eventually we get better and better. And vast numbers of people who were wanting that worldview jumped on this and said, this is the solution. And we can push this whole idea further and further back, just chance, and then good things are, are preferentially preserved and bad things preferentially die out and so we can go all the way back from nothing getting a little bit better all the time now that was an idea which was so eagerly awaited that it instantly became popular people like Richard Dawkins have been so delighted with Darwin ever since he said Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Lots of people wanted to be atheists, but until Darwin gave them a mechanism that they could believe in, it was not possible to be intellectually fulfilled. You had just wishful thinking, but now you had a mechanism you could believe in, so you could be intellectually fulfilled with that worldview. And since Darwin made this possibility of believing this, in spite of the evidence of design, this worldview started to really take off. It started to take off about 200 years ago, and it is now, in the West at least, probably the predominant worldview. Now, there are lots of ideas that flow from this. For example, if the creation was created by a creator, then it's logical to think that he would reveal himself in some way. After all, if he has made this creation with a, crea with a purpose, then wouldn't it be logical to expect that he might communicate that purpose to his creation? And if that is the case, then those who are willing to search for him ought to be able to find him. 
and the way he's communicating with us. Now, of course, with the other world view, man can, of course, only know what he can find out for himself. And therefore, anything that purports to be a revelation must be false. And if you are going to consistently take this worldview, then obviously you will consistently look for any such revelation. If you want this worldview, you will be very unhappy with the idea of a revelation. And you will do all you can to close your eyes to it. Well, there are many documents purporting to be divine revelation. The Buddhists have the Tapitaka, Muslims have the Quran, the Hindus have got the Vedas, and of course the Bible. Well, is there anything to choose between all these revelations? Is there anything to suggest that one is in any way more valuable than the other? And as soon as one asks that question, one finds that there is one which stands out as completely different to all the others. And that is the Bible. It is completely different in three main ways. Now, the first way is that the Bible is full of prophecy. There are more than 4,000 specific prophecies in the Bible. And in the other holy books, there aren't any. But now, the Bible has got very specific prophecies, many of which have been fulfilled, and fulfilled <coughs> spectacularly accurately. And a point about these prophecies is that God claims in the Bible that you can tell whether these, the prophet who has made them is telling the truth, because if he has spoken, it will come to pass. And there are thousands of specific prophecies which have come to pass, many of them very surprising and unusual. So that's the first way the Bible is very <coughs> different to all the others. The second way, salvation is a free gift. In all the other holy books, we find salvation is attained by works. If we look at Islam, you, you've got to pray five times a day, you've got to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, you've got to keep the fast of Ramadan, and there's no guarantee that's going to get you there. In fact, there's only one way that you're guaranteed salvation, and that is to die while conducting jihad while fighting against the enemies of Islam. Which explains why there are so many Muslims who are happy to be suicide bombers. It's the only way they know that they can get salvation, for certain. Whereas Christianity is the only religion, and the Bible lays out the only system where salvation is a free gift. Salvation was in, acquired by Jesus' sacrifice, and all you have to do is accept it. And the third point about the Bible compared to all the other holy books is it is consistent. All the others are not. For example, the, the Hindu's holy book. Well, you've got to be a good boy or a good girl, otherwise you will have rotten karma, but when you go back to the beginning, we're actually only Brahman's dream. In all the other gods as well are also just part of Brahman's dream, and being the great god, his dream is so real that we in it actually think there's something going on here. We don't realize we're just part of his dream. Now, if we are part of his dream, are we responsible for what he dreams about? If we do something bad because he's dreaming we are doing it, 
should we really pay the penalty of coming back as a flea? Surely it's Brahman who ought... You know, this is totally inconsistent. There is only one consistent holy book, and that is the Bible. So this one stands out, and anybody who actually seriously wants to look into the question is led inexorably to this. You've got so many examples, people like Sunda Singh, people in other religions, seriously seeking, and they find inconsistencies and things just don't work, and eventually they end up here. Because it's the only one that's consistent. And therefore, it is the only one which is a threat to the other worldview. And anybody who looks into it has to realize this is a very serious threat. Even if the only thing to go on were its prophecies. Now, there are thousands in the Bible, but just to look at three of them, it, it, spe it speaks about the future of many cities. One of them, Tyre. Now, Tyre was a big city, a very prosperous city, a very strong city. It had huge walls, it was very prosperous. And if you look at Ezekiel chapter 26, there's a prophecy against Tyre. And it says, many people will come against you. They will fight against you and overcome you. And Nebuchadnezzar will come and destroy you. And then he makes an amazing prophecy. It says that even the dust will be scraped off the rock and thrown into the sea so that there will be nothing left and it will be a place where fishermen spread their nets. Well, Nebuchadnezzar did come and he destroyed the city and left it a heap of ru ruins. But the the rich people of Tyre, having a powerful fleet, sailed to an island and built a city there. They built an even stronger fortress. When Nebuchadnezzar had gone, there were lots of attempts to rebuild this city. And always an army would come and destroy it. And eventually, this was the powerful city. This was a heap of ruins. Then Alexander the Great came along. But he didn't have a powerful navy, and he wanted to capture Tyre, so he took all the broken buildings, all the tumbled down walls, and built a causeway out to that island, and he scraped every single thing off that rock, even the dust, and it was left a smooth, bare rock. And today it's the same. It's a place where fishermen spread their nets. And, of course, the greatest prophecies are about the Messiah, Jesus. Very many of those have been fulfilled. But there are quite a lot which have not yet been fulfilled. And this is a source of great distress for those who want to hold the will view that man is autonomous, that the creation created itself. You will find that they are extremely unhappy with the Bible. You will find that the people who want to have that will view are not fighting against the Koran or the Tapitaka or the Vedas. Their fight is again the Bible. There have been many very well-known, very clever, very intelligent people engaged in this fight against the Bible. One, Julian Huxley, a very influential man, the first Secretary General of the United States nation's educational, scientific, and cultural organization. And his aim was to bring secular humanism into every aspect of education worldwide. 
and to bring in evolution and to wipe out everything to do with Christianity in education. An interesting man. On a television program, he was asked about evolution and he made an amazing statement. He said, we all jumped on the origin of species because the notion of God was a restriction on our sexual morals. Now, that ought to strike one as a very strange thing to say. Here's this man promoting evolution worldwide in the education system. And he gives the reason for jumping on the Darwin bandwagon, not the fact that there's a huge amount of evidence. Not the fact that it's a totally convincing theory, or that it's proved, but because the notion of God was a restriction on our sexual morals. Now, he was actually here quoting loosely from his brother, Aldous Huxley, and we'll look at the full quote later. But you can see what they really dislike about the idea of God, and of course he means the God of the Bible because being a philosopher and looking into it he knows perfectly well he can disregard the others, they're all inconsistent. What he dislikes is God's moral standards. And of course God is very strict on his moral standards. You shall not commit adultery. Atheists don't like hearing that. They don't like being told what to do. It doesn't say it doesn't say it's not really a good idea to commit adultery and to spoil your marriage. It says you shall not do it. It says man marriage is honourable on all, all, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. It's not God might judge them if he gets round to it. Or he might get judged if you do it too often. It's God will judge. And then it's equally uncompromising on the permanence of marriage. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and their twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And he gives a reason. Because he sought a godly offspring. And a permanent one man, one wife, for life is the only way of producing godly offspring. And there are instructions on how to go about building such a marriage. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Tell that to a secular humanist, particularly a feminist. What? Me? Submit to my husband. It's an equal partnership. There's no problem. <coughs> Husbands, love your wives even, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Today people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear love the woman you married. They want to hear marry the woman you love. And if you fall out of love with the one you've got, no problem. Out of the way, go and look for someone else. You know, people don't like following the good advice that God gives because he knows best. He knows that's the only way the marriage will work. And he knows that people will only be happy in this kind of marriage. But when you come across people like Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous atheists of the 20th century, he was known as a serial adulterer. Interesting, when he was old, he said, there is a pain in the center of my being which will never go away. He proved for himself that his style of life doesn't lead to, uh, to exactly satisfaction and contentment. But it's not only sexual freedom that's required by the atheist, the secular humanist. 
Julian Huxley on that television program was loosely quoting from his brother Aldous Huxley and his full, the full quote is this the liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality we objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom but that's not all they want they're dissatisfied with the political and economic system that had arisen in the West, particularly in Europe and America. And they were dissatisfied because in both Europe and America, the political and economic system was based firmly on the Bible. Common law had been instituted by King Alfred and his aim was to stick as close as possible to what the Bible says and wherever there are cases that are to dealt, be dealt with that are not covered by the Bible to use its principles to come to a system of law which would be acceptable to God. And that system was extended in America and there's a problem with that whole worldview, that whole legal system, that whole political system for someone who doesn't want to follow the Bible. Because if one is going to have sexual freedom and promiscuity, then you are going to have undesirable pregnancy. Now, if you've got the worldview that the boy is a pig, is a dog, you've got no problem. If you've got a pig or a dog that you don't want, well, you just destroy it. And since there's really no difference between a pig and a dog and a boy, you can get rid of unwanted pregnancies too. But you see, that means changing the whole legal system. It means changing everything about what was the standard norm of society and it has changed worldwide as the worldview of humanism has flooded society and now millions of abortions are being conducted every year and nobody thinks twice about it after all a boy is a pig is a dog why not this requires a completely godless society. And if you look over history, you will find there has only ever really been one society which has claimed no God. Man is totally <coughs> in control, and that is the communist system. Many people have wondered why the academic institutions of the West and South Africa have been filled with communists. Well, it's because the academics who want that worldview that the universe created itself, there's no creator. It's the only system that they can go to. It's the one that naturally draws anyone who hates the idea of a creator because in our evolutionary conception of the universe there is absolutely no room for a creator or a ruler now that was written by Friedrich Engels Engels and Marx worked together they worked together and they edited each other's works and they wrote Das Kapital together this is the central point about communism and that is why so many the academics the thinkers one wonders why on earth would they be drawn to communism this is the reason no creator no ruler and a political system with which is built on that foundation whereas the west's foundation was built on a totally different foundation it was built on the truth of the Bible. The society the West used to have was built on 
the precepts of the Bible and looking at things like these six things the Lord hates, hands that shed innocent blood. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. Well, once you push God out of it, you are free to, to produce really unrighteous decrees. Look at the decrees of communist Russia. Absolutely appalling, repressive, but so what? We're in charge, we're our own boss, we can make whatever laws we want. There's no higher authority. Karl Marx realized the absolute essential nature of the basis of his whole system. The whole system of getting rid of God and building a society based only on the reasoning of man was Darwin's idea. Mark said, Darwin's book is very important and serves me as a basis for the class struggle in history. Writing to Engels, he said, this is the book which contains the basis in natural science for our view. Without Darwin's work, he would not have been able to make a convincing case for communism. He wanted to dedicate Das Kapital to Darwin. Darwin's wife refused. Marxism is built 100% on Darwinism. Another of the very influential communists, Joseph Stalin, he said, evolution prepares for evolution and creates the ground for it. For many years, when the communists were taking over new ground, new countries, the very first thing they did was to start teaching evolution. They wouldn't start teaching communist economics or communist principles until they had got everything grounded in evolution. It's that important. And, of course, in our own country, we've also got people like this, our first ANC president, with his communist clenched fist salute. And then you probably notice the chap who succeeded him in his red cap. If you don't recognize him like that, he's a better photo of him. And then, if you look today at our Minister of Higher Education, Blade and Simandi, the leader of the South African Communist Party. Now, when the ANC took over, and it was known that these are all communists, people said, but look, Russia has fallen in disarray. Communism has proved itself totally unworkable. It does not work, it's collapsed. But, our South African Communist Party said, oh no, they collapsed because they were Marxist-Leninists. And Marxism-Leninism doesn't work. What really works is Marxist-Gramskyism. Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, was one of the founders of the Italian Communist Party. And he is the favorite theorist of the South African Communist Party. They all rely on the works of Gramsci. So the South African Communist Party are Gramskyists. So let's just look at one or two of the things that Gramsci says. His instructions to communists. Marx eyes the inner man to alter the Christian mind to turn it into its opposite in all its details, so that it would become not merely a non-Christian mind, but an anti-Christian mind. And to do this, well, everything must be done in the name of man's dignity and rights. And in the name 
name of his autonomy and freedom from outside restraint, from the claims and restraints of Christianity above all. See, Gramsci, like all communists, has one really big hate, Christianity. Blade and Simandi, as Minister of Higher Education, what do you think is his number one priority? Have you looked at the school syllabuses these days? Have you looked at what's going on in the school? Not surprisingly, what's going on suggests that his prime aim is to trample the Bible. And in typical communist fashion, the first thing to be done in driving out the Christian worldview is bringing evolution into education. When, when we see evolution being taught, we are told this has nothing to do with religion. This is only to do with scientific fact. But it's interesting to see what the atheists say about evolution. This statement was made by Richard Bozarth, a well-known American atheist, in an article, The Meaning of Evolution, in the periodical The American Atheist. He said, evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins and this is what evolution means then Christianity is nothing. Is this anything to do with religion? It's to do with nothing else but religion. But we are told that evolution and the things that are being taught to our children in school are pure science, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Christianity or atheism. Well, is that true? To answer that, we need to look at what is science and what is evolution. And hopefully, we'll look at that tomorrow. more than 10,000 years old. When I saw that definition, I was really amazed because I've often seen definitions of fossils before. And the definition, I checked it in all the dictionaries I have, it says a fossil 
is the hardened remains of uh, a formerly living creature. So I wondered why are the children being given the definition? It is the hardened remains of a creature which is more than 10,000 years old. Now, there's only one reason I can think of for putting in that as part of the definition that it's more than 10,000 years old. Because if you pick up a fossil, you've definitely got a fossil. You can see it's a fossil. And by definition, it's more than 10,000 years old. Therefore, the Bible must be wrong. Because the Bible doesn't go beyond 10,000 years. So you have got a definition there which you won't find in the dictionary. But it's a definition that guarantees the Bible is wrong. Now, you can find uh, places where fossils are forming. It takes exceptional chemical and bacterial conditions, but you can find them forming, and you can have something fossilized in about two weeks. And you pick that up, and it's definitely a fossil. It looks just like any other fossil. But you know that two weeks ago, it wasn't a fossil at all. But by definition, it's more than 10,000 years old. So this whole story of fossils, it has been twisted to, to put the facts in a different light. Now, if it is a fact that fossils can form in two weeks, as they have been observed to do, it takes very special conditions, but they have been observed to do it, why should we assume that any fossil is very old? It can happen in two weeks. So where does the idea that it formed millions of years ago come from? You know, after all, they don't come with a date on it um, made in minus 573,000 BC or something. They don't come with the data. Where does the idea come from? Now, the, the people who want you to believe they're millions of years old, they'll say, oh, radiometric dating. Radiometric dating cannot date fossils. Radiometric dating can only date volcanic rock. And volcanic rock cannot contain fossils because any living creature in molten lava is just going to get burnt up. You do not get fossils in rocks that can be dated radiometrically. You had a slide up there where you were contrasting Christianity with other religions. And then um, one point that caught my attention was salvation as a free gift in the Christian context. And then um, salvation by words. So then do good works come from nothing if salvation is a free gift? They count nothing as far as your salvation goes, but if you have salvation, then you will, you will naturally do what God tells you to do because it will be the desire of your heart to live the way he wants you to. Not because, oh, well, I've got to. I can't be unfaithful to my wife because God will hit me with a big stick. Your attitude will be, I'm thankful that God has got my best interests at heart and he knows that if I give my all for my wife, I'll have a wonderful marriage. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, concerning Christians that already believe in God, um, they believe in what Jesus did on the cross. And they still believe in millions of years, they believe in the whole natural process um, of evolution and so forth, that God, it's, it's a way that God used it to bring this. Is that a viable uh, theory, or why is it important to believe um, that God 
created uh, in relatively short time ago the earth? Well, a Christian is very, very fortunate because the Christian has got the manufacturer's handbook, and that is the Bible. In the Bible, God gives you all the information you need for a truly fulfilled, happy life. And if you follow what the Bible says, you will find fulfillment flows automatically. You might not find wealth or ease or comfort. You may find exactly the opposite, but you will find fulfillment and purpose and real joy. If you don't believe the Bible, then you are going to rob yourself of the most valuable possession we have. That is God's instruction. And if you're going to start believing the wisdom of this world instead of the Bible, and if you're going to try and say, well, the Bible says this, but the people wise with the wisdom of this world have proved that, so, well, we've got to bring this in and change the Bible to accept it. Then you are diluting your heritage. And instead of having the wisdom of God to guide you in every step, you're polluting it with the wisdom of man. And you don't have that guide, that infallible guide. Now, it's, it, it's very tempting to look to the wisdom of man and say, oh, yes, well, he's a clever chap, and he's done lots of research, and he's got a PhD in the subject, so he must know better than God. And the TV says it. And the school textbook says it. It must be true. Well, I have looked for many, many years into all the things that the textbooks say and the people wise with the wisdom of this world say. And I started off <coughs> as an atheist. I spent many years of my life as an atheist. I spent what should have been the best years of my life as an atheist, reveling in the things that these people were saying. Bertrand Russell was one of my heroes. And when I became a Christian, I carried all this rubbish along with me. And I believed in evolution and the Big Bang and millions of years and all sorts of rubbish. And I thought, well, this is all true, so well, the Bible must mean this when it says that. But I started looking into all these things and found out that the, what I'd been believing on authority, on the authority of those wise with the wisdom of this world, simply does not stand up. When you look at the evidence, all those millions of years, they just crumble, they fall away. All that evolution, it just crumbles away. I I used to lecture at Fitz, and I was um, a thoroughgoing atheist, but I was very, very interested in science. And that had been my burning passion for years and years. As a lecturer, I had the privilege of being able to study without paying. So I, uh, I studied biology. And we were given all this stuff on evolution, all very uh, convincing. I mugged it all up, read the textbook, did the exams. Absolutely certain, confident evolution is true. When I started looking, I looked at all the things the textbooks didn't tell you. 
you know, all the evidence that points towards e evolution, they will magnify it. All the evidence that shows it cannot be true, they don't mention a word of it. And then most of the really convincing proofs, well, I want to show you some of them tomorrow. And you can see how convincing they are as soon as you open your eyes. I, I used to go on geology field trips when I studied geology. And we would come and look at a rock face and the, the instructor would say, well, this is this and that's how it happened. You'd look and say, yes, yes, yes. But looking at that stuff now, I wonder, how on earth was it possible to believe his story when you can see in those rocks that he cannot be like that? That had to form so quickly that this whole lot we're looking at, it's the most days, not millions of years. And it's just staring at you in the rocks. And yet, with this mindset, you can accept these stupid stories of millions of years and never notice that the evidence there in the rocks just goes completely against it. And I'll show you some of that evidence, um, maybe not next time, at the time afterwards. And you look at the evidence, it's just so utterly and completely obvious. You think, how could I ever have been fooled? Yes. I just want to know, like, why is that? Is it that, for instance, when you look at all the writings by the communists that you mentioned, today, like Marxists, Marxism, and all the others? Why is it that like most of their policies are targeted towards the Christian God? I know you put up a quote there. Yeah, but I know you put up a quote there that, um, for instance, I don't remember the name of the guy you quoted, but then he wants all the concepts of God to be removed simply because they place a restriction on their se um, sexual morality. But then when I look at the Muslim faith, it sort of does the same thing. They're also strict in terms of like sexual immorality to the point where they install people. So I'm just wondering why are all of them targeted towards the Christian God, even with atheists like Alistair Crowley and Marilyn Murray, they're all targeted towards the Christian God. They are all, be simply based all on the fact that every single one. Simply because all the others they can see are false. So they're targeting the Christian one because they know it. That's the only one which is a threat to them. It's the only one that's consistent. It's the only one that could be true. The others, their internal evidence shows they cannot be true because they're not consistent. The Bible is the only one which is a threat to the atheist because he cannot dismiss it. You can dismiss the Quran. You look at um, the Quran, even Muhammad admitted it is inconsistent. And he said, where it contradicts itself, the things I wrote most recently are true and the others are false. <laughs> so there you have Muhammad himself admitting it's not consistent. Well, you know, if this, is, if this has, has displaced those and those are now false, what if he'd lived another year, he might have written something which showed oh, that was false too. So what is there in the Quran that you can take as being God's word? You know, he wrote this, but now he wrote that, so this is false. He wrote that, but he wrote this, so now this is false. It is just not, con you, can, you can ignore it. If you happen to be born into Islam and it's been, you've been brainwashed, then, well, you just sort of accept it. until you come up with the truth. And there are, there are vast numbers of them. The people in Islam who, you don't hear it reported in the newspapers, but there are vast numbers of people in, in Islam turning to Christianity. Because what they've got is simply not satisfying. It's not consistent. And it's not true. 
there's a um, there's a very interesting DVD. It's called Islam Rising, and one of the people involved is a former Hamas terrorist, and he went to America to set up uh, terrorist cells there and to do lots of uh, Muslim propaganda. There's a huge amount of Muslim propaganda. I don't know if you've noticed how many films there are. Totally untrue, pro-Muslim, anti-Christian propaganda, things like Robin Hood, City of God. It's a case of your enemy's enemy is your friend. So you're quite happy to accept and even promote Islam because it's an enemy of Christianity. And your enemy's enemy is your friend. Um, I can't remember how I got onto that, but the but the only enemy is the Bible. You can you can look at it this way. A lie is not threatened by another lie. A lie is only threatened by the truth. The only threat to communism, to secular humanism, to atheism, the only threat is the Bible. And that is what they are all against. You can look through the, um, the literature, the so-called scientific literature, you'll find lots of attacks on the Bible. You won't find any attacks on Confucius or on Vishnu, Krishna, Muhammad. It's only against Jesus. Because the lie is not concerned with other lies. The only threat to the lie is the truth. I studied psychology. And, um, you know, Carl Jung, he said a lot about we learn through fairy tales and so on. But that's our frame of mind or a paradigm we have, and that's the way we learn. So then we grew up with um, magicians and so on, and we think, okay, they do great things, but they're not real, they don't really exist. And then we learn about someone like God, and then we think, okay, maybe he's just also maybe like a fairy tale or magician, but then you think, but, but he is real. And that's amazing to think that he is real, it's not just a fairy tale or something, he is as big as that. It's not just like a fairy tale book or something. Yeah, well, Carl Jung is a fairly typical anti-Christian. And now this whole story about magicians, you know, it's just a fairy tale. That, I think you will find a very strange story to someone who comes out of a culture where it has not been hidden. When I first came to Africa, I went to Nigeria, and uh, I, I was a complete atheist, and it amazed me to see these people indulging in witchcraft, which I had been brought up to think, well, it, there's nothing there, it's just superstition. <laughs> How wrong can you be? Witchcraft is real and it's powerful, <laughs> and the only reason why people in the West ever got the idea that it was not is that Christianity was more powerful. You see, when Christianity went to Britain, Europe, the whole place was ruled by very powerful magicians called Druids. And um, it, it amazes me when, when people read of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they sort of think, what a joke, these people calling down fire. Um, well, Isaiah challenged them to something they normally did. That's why they were quite happy. He <coughs> said, fine. His challenge was, you kill that bull, put it on the wood, and call down the fire. And I said, well, sure, we are doing that all the time. The amazing thing was that it didn't work. 
And that's exactly what happened when the early Christians came to Europe. The Druids terrorized the people and they did what they wanted every year um, at um, Halloween. They would uh, go to the village and uh, decide on a virgin that was going to be sacrificed. They'd go to the house and say, give up your daughter. Now the people did it, not because they wanted to get rid of their daughter, but they knew perfectly well that if they didn't give their daughter, instead of her being put on the, the sacrificial pyre and the fire called down to burn her up, they would call down the fire on their house and burn all of them up. And this was a reality to them. But what happened when the Christians came, full of the power of the Holy Spirit, they said, we stand against you Druids in the name of Jesus. And their fire didn't come down from heaven, just as with Elijah. So the Druids, having lost their power, they succumbed, Christianity took over for the very simple reason it had the power to break the witchcraft that had been ruling the people. The people turned to it because this is power which can overcome what they had been afraid of. And now, throughout the time when I grew up, you know, people would think, oh, witchcraft is a joke. Because witchcraft had died out under the power of Christianity. Now it's coming back very rapidly. There's a huge following of witchcraft throughout the formerly civilized world. And I can assure you, it's as powerful as it ever was. And the reason is that the church has lost its power. Instead of believing the Bible and living by it, they believe what the people wise with the wisdom of the world tell them. I have come across revival where God is working in power. He works in miracles and Satan's chains are broken. But it's very, very few and it's only among people who take the word of God 100%. This is true. I've never found anything like that happening among compromisers who put the wisdom of this world in as well. It just doesn't happen. So Christianity largely has lost its power, so witchcraft is coming back very strongly. And you don't have to be in witchcraft very long before you realize you've really got power here. I used to know um, a witch who could do all sorts of things. One of the favorite things she used to do was call down plagues of frogs on people she needed to conjure against. And their whole, their, their house would be full of frogs, their cooking pots full of frogs, their beds full of frogs. Their life was made of misery from frogs. Why? Because she, she could call down the power of the, the spirits which ruled her. Now, there's a huge price to pay. There's a huge price to being a witch or a wizard. You have to submit yourself completely to the spirits that indwell you and they rule over you. Now this particular woman, to show her submission to the spirits that gave her the power, they demanded that she eat her food on her hands and knees off the floor like a dog. Just to show her submission to them. Now, um, I came across a uh, a European girl who was a witch. She was a very beautiful girl. And, you know, girls really like the idea of being absolutely irresistible. And men just cannot help falling for her. And she sold her soul into this for that power. But that didn't do her any good either because she was used to destroy the testimony of anyone, uh, any Christian in the Durban area who had a testimony for the Lord. And what would happen is that 
the spirits dominating her would say, get ready, you're going on assignment. So she put on her makeup and her nice clothes, and she said the last thing she remembered was locking the door behind her. And she knew nothing until she arrived back home and unlocked the door. The whole of the time she was out, she was so utterly and completely in the, under the control of the spirits dominating her, she did not know one single thing she'd done. But she said she knew she had succeeded because every time she got home, the condition of her body told her she had had sexual intercourse with somebody and she had no idea who. So, you know, Satan's wages are pretty bad. <coughs> he doesn't give satisfaction. <laughs> well, I really think it's time people decide what, you know, what they believe or not, because we do go on, and we do go on this trip up. Even, um, I know it's quite from Pakistan, he's a Christian as well, he studied here, he's, he went back to Pakistan, and he started Bible school there. And he's really a good man of God, so close relationship and so on. And he gave a seminar about um, Islam and so on. And I thought, okay, way back, but, okay, I was born Christian and this is why I believe in that. And they were born is, uh, Islam, so that's why I believe that. But when you get the facts about it, you, know, you see that those people, they only stay there because of fear. And they don't even know the Quran that well. And um, ridic ridiculous stuff, like, for example, I could be wrong, but something like, Allah has something like 100 names, but we only know, or they only know 99. And then they say, but who knows the other one? And they say, this camel knows it. And they ask him, for example, how do you know the camel knows it? And he said, look at him, he's happy, he's smiling. <laughs> and that's really literally there. And really, it's really funny, you know, and stuff like um, the Bible is in chronological order. I don't think the Quran is, they just put it in that way, the biggest books, they put it in front, so it looks more impressive. So it contradicts itself all the time. But I think people out there don't really know enough, and they don't really want to make a decision. Now it's, it's better to not to know. So you can just keep on going. So. Yeah, and a point about the Quran is it's so boring that it's very really difficult to bring yourself to read it. I, I resolved to read the Quran a couple of years ago. And I struggled on for a few days, but it is so boring. It's so, you know, it's just so obviously not true. You know, there's nothing in it to draw you. It's just not worth reading. What can we do to, not to convince them, but to make them if you have a friend or something, yes, we pray for that person, but what more can we do for Well, I think a good thing to do would be to get that video, Islam Rising. And the chap, Kamal, who was a mass terrorist, he tells of how he got saved. All that happened was that when he got injured, two Christians, looked after him as if he was their brother. Yeah, I think the biggest way to it, I can call it that, Christians have his love. Um, and even Jesus, he didn't, he, he came here and he was a prince and so on, but he didn't tell us what to do, he must do this and do this. He just lived by example. He didn't judge anybody. He just lived by example and through love, and that's what people followed him. And I think when people who don't believe, see that love in you, they will think, but what is it, that thing you have? They want to get to know it better. And then they will actually start looking for it. But if you tell them what to do all the time, you actually chase them away and think, no, don't tell me what to do. So I think your, your example, the way you live your life, is your biggest destiny. And through love, that's all. And the other thing is, sorry I speak too much now, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when you, know, when you spread the word and so on, we feel this pressure, you know, you have to do the actual catching, but we don't do that. We only cast the lines. Jesus does the catching. So immediately the pressure is off you. You just have to cast the line and Jesus will do the actual catching. You cannot save anybody. It's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit that does the whole thing. All you have to do is be available. What effect does evolution have, that kind of worldview, 
on all this rise of stuff that we see like the new age and uh, even Hollywood, sexual promiscuity, the whole shebang. Is there a connection except that they are from the same source or um, are, they, are they intertwined or not? They're very much intertwined, yes. And maybe we'll look at that tomorrow, but you've got a worldview which says everything happens by chance. There is no meaning to life. There is no responsibility to life. The only thing worth doing in life is looking for pleasure. And we have a huge drug problem. But why not? There's no meaning in life, so why not spend your time hallucinating? At least that's interesting. It's fun. At least it's fun for a while until you're addicted and can't do without it. But why not? Why shouldn't I? I can do what I want with my life. And, and since there's no meaning, I might just as well get high on drugs. It goes hand in hand with a worldview of meaninglessness, lack of responsibility. The evolutionary worldview has had a huge influence on, on society. And if you come across most children today, they are so brainwashed by television, DVDs, and school. Christianity is a fairy story and millions of years are a solid fact. But praise God, I was like that, and he broke into me, so he can even break into the kids. You know, the truth is so much more powerful than the lie, that when the crack opens, that dynamite can just blow it open.